About half of Canada's landmass is permafrost, and some fear it's a ticking time bomb for climate change. With us for more, in Pasadena, California, Kimberly Miner, climate scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab working on the Arctic Methane Project. She's also a professor at the University of Maine. In Woods Hole, Massachusetts, that's near Cape Cod, John Holdren, former science advisor to President Barack Obama and research professor at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. And in our nation's capital, Antoni Levkovich, professor of geography, environment, and geomatics at the University of Ottawa. And as I thank the three of you for joining us here on TVO tonight, let me just set up our discussion with a bit of a fact file here. The Arctic is warming three times faster than the planet as a whole. Permafrost covers a quarter of the Northern Hemisphere's land and stores around 1.5 trillion metric tons of organic carbon. That's twice as much as Earth's atmosphere currently holds. And most of this carbon is the remains of ancient life encased in frozen soil for up to hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, that's a bit of background. Let's get started here with a better understanding of what that represents in terms of threats. Kimberly, you want to start us off? How would you describe the threat all of that represents? So I think we've got a variety of different threats that we are looking at with the permafrost. So as you mentioned, there is the potential for an output of carbon, um, both in the form of methane and CO2, and that could severely punctuate the warming that we're already seeing in the atmosphere if it were to be released. John Holdren, what would you characterize the threat as? Well, as you noted, Steve, some have characterized permafrost as a time bomb. I think it's more like a wildfire that's already doing damage. Uh, we know for sure that it's going to grow. And what we are unable to determine exactly is how fast and how much it's going to grow. But the dangers, uh, as Kimberly has already pointed out, are, are multiple, and many of them are already occurring. So it's, uh, it's already happening. And the real question is, how much bigger will it get and how fast? And Tony, what would you add to that? Um, my typical analogy of permafrost thaw and the impacts of climate change causing that thaw are, is as a, a freight train. It's actually quite difficult to get permafrost to move in any given direction. There's a lot of heat that you need to get into the ground uh, to change the state of permafrost. But once it gets going, it's very difficult to stop as well. And uh, certainly the amount of carbon in permafrost, as Kimberly mentioned, and the potential for it to be released into the atmosphere is a serious problem, I think, for all everybody in the world. John, just before we get to those questions, uh, I'd like some better understanding of why there is, in fact, so much carbon trapped in the permafrost. How did that happen? Uh, what has happened is over the millennia, we have had cycles of glaciation and then interglacial warmer periods. And what has happened is in the warmer periods, uh, we have a lot of uh, plant growth. Uh, some of that plant growth ends up sequestered in the soil. Uh, the uh, subsequent freezing cycle embeds it in permafrost. And this has happened uh, so often that, as uh, I think has already been noted, in some places the permafrost is hundreds, uh, hundreds of feet thick uh, and contains uh, an immense amount of material that has been frozen and therefore uh, protected from decomposition by bacteria. Uh, and as noted, it adds up to about twice as much carbon stored in the permafrost as currently exists in the atmosphere. That means if any substantial fraction of that carbon is released as CO2 uh, and methane, it's going to significantly impact the global carbon balance and reduce the chances uh, that society's emissions reductions uh, could actually constrain the increase in global surface temperature to, let us say, uh, 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or 2.5. Uh, I personally think that 1.5, which is one of the aspirational goals of the international community, is almost certainly already out of reach. But the permafrost could place 2 degrees or even 2.5 degrees out of reach, uh, depending on how much comes out, how fast. Hmm. And Tony, when did science first come to realize that this was an important problem? 
Well, relatively recently, and I think that's always our worry, is that we, we keep learning more and um, almost never have um, steps forward that we think are really very good steps. And this is a case in point. So the first publication that really put together all of the information about soil carbon in permafrost was in 2009. And it came out from hundreds of soil pits that have been dug around uh, around the, the, the north of, of uh, the around the Arctic over the previous many decades in Russia, in Alaska, in Canada, and elsewhere. And this also drew out from the International Polar Year, which really brought together scientists from around the north in, in lots of different fields, not just permafrost. And all of this came together in a publication where basically it was sort of, let's total this all up. Let's use what we know to try and create a synthesis. And the synthesis came back with actually very similar numbers to the numbers that we now have even uh, 10, 12 years later, the, as the numbers that you mentioned earlier on, sort of one and a half trillion tons of, of carbon uh, stored in permafrost at various depths. So some of it will be, would be released relatively quickly as permafrost thaws, Others may, other parts might take much longer, but really Kimberly's the expert on, uh, on methane release in particular. Which is why I'm going to go to her right now. Thawing permafrost also releases methane. And how big a concern for you is that release of methane? So I think both of my colleagues have really hit on this question. Um, the release of methane has the potential to increase the amount of warming in the atmosphere in a really, really punctuated way because it has a little bit more warming power than CO2. And so basically, as the potential for this degradation happens in the permafrost with warming, we go from a frozen state of permafrost where we're, we've got kind of a... a static amount of carbon into a very mobilized carbon um, as warming happens. So the microbes are basically eating the carbon and transforming it into a gas. And this isn't a process, as both of my colleagues have mentioned, that's going to be very stoppable. It, both the train example and the wildfire example were excellent ways to think about this because we don't really have the power to control the warming um, and the local permafrost environment. Uh, and Tony, tell me, when was the first time that you traveled to the Arctic? Um, in 1976. Yeah, 76. And how plane. many times do you think you've been there since? Uh, pretty well every every year. Um, so, um, and in 2019, I had the chance to go back to sites where I had not been for 40 years on Banks Island. And that was really interesting to see uh, what changes had happened in the landscape over that preceding 40 years. And I knew the area very well because I'd spent three summers there. Um, parts of my early youth, let's put it that way. Okay, so you're having been to this area so many times, what kinds of changes have you seen over the intervening decades? Well, what I really saw was that the surface of the land did not look the same. I mean, the hills are still there, the valleys are still there, but at the surface level, what we saw was that a landscape that had been relatively kind of uh, smooth uh, back in the 1970s was now uh, crossed by troughs by settled areas which had settled out. And the reason for that is that in the, from 1998 and several years in the 2000s, we'd had particularly warm summers. And those warm summers had caused the top of the permafrost to thaw. And where it was ice rich, where we have what are called ice wedges, which are bodies of ice in the ground, the tops of those ice wedges had thawed and the ground had settled above them. And what I really learned from that, or observed from that, uh, and has been written about by others as well, is that it's not just the general trends that are worrisome about permafrost, so not just generally getting warmer, but the extremes. And that we've also seen in terms of floods and fires elsewhere, and the extremes are getting more extreme in permafrost areas. And so warmer summers are becoming still warmer, and they are impacting what was an equilibrium that has existed probably for hundreds or even thousands of years, and they're changing uh, ir changing irreversibly the landscape. Let me beg the indulgence of your two colleagues for a second here by having you take us through a couple of pictures which will reflect that which you've just described. Here's the first one. Why don't you tell us what we're seeing in this picture here? That's uh, called a retrogressive thaw slump. Nice name. RTS is easier to say, but it's caused by material uh, detaching 
from the surface of the permafrost. And then where you see all of that sort of black, shiny surface in this picture, that's all ice. And so if we expose that ice, it begins to melt back. Um, and it does that every summer. And these features look like great big gravel pits and can reach uh, areas. We have some that are called mega slumps on the Peel Plateau, uh, where they're hundreds of meters across. And back in uh, the early 1980s, when I did some work on Banks Island, which is a westernmost island in the Arctic, Ar the Canadian Arctic archipelago, there were about 60 of those slumps that were active on Banks Island, and probably there had been 60 or 100. So for many, many years, they live, they kind of reactivate every year for about 10, 20, 30 years, and then eventually they stabilize. So there were 60. Well, by 2018, there were 4,000 of those slumps active on Banks Island, which just shows you the huge changes mm. that are taking place in the landscape. All right, let me ask John about a place that they call the gateway to hell, the Batagaika Crater in Siberia, Russia. It's almost a kilometer long, 86 meters deep. John, how did this happen? Well, it happened because of the thawing of particularly ice-rich permafrost. Uh, when permafrost has a very high ice content and it thaws, uh, that basically accentuates the slumping problem. And so you have a combination of slumping and landslides that can occur in this circumstance and, and produce uh, basically uh, a big crater. Uh, some of them quickly fill with water. Uh, they're called thermokarst lakes. Uh, eventually, uh, the water may go away and simply leave uh, this gigantic depression, this gigantic hole in the ground. It's just another uh, indication of the magnitude and the pace at which permafrost thaw is changing the Arctic. Uh, there are many other changes in the Arctic that are very rapid and that are uh, interlocked in different ways with permafrost thaw, by the way. Wildfires in the Arctic are getting bigger and hotter. Even the tundra is burning. Uh, it used to be too moist to burn, but tundra is burning now uh, across the Arctic. And those wildfires accelerate uh, permafrost thaw. Um, you have the disappearance of the sea ice uh, in the Arctic, the retreat of the sea ice, which accentuates coastal erosion because waves can now reach the shore. Uh, which didn't reach the shore before. Uh, and that is combining with permafrost thaw to accelerate coastal erosion. So we really have a multifaceted set of issues of which permafrost thaw is perhaps ultimately the most dangerous to the whole world because as already been noted, the accelerating release of methane and carbon dioxide can push out of reach uh, the world's targets for stabilizing the climate. All right, let's do one more of these. And Kimberly, perhaps I'll get you to speak to this one. We've got a GIF here. In 2020, a Russian television crew flying over the Siberian tundra spotted this massive crater. It's 30 meters deep. It's 20 meters wide. Any idea what caused this to appear? Yeah, I remember when these started appearing and folks were very surprised and unclear about what was going on. Um, and what we've really discovered is that there is a potential for the erosion and breakup of carbon really throughout the permafrost so that even the deeper levels of permafrost have the potential to be transformed into their gaseous state and maybe in the form of methane. So that if methane is stored in the deeper layers of permafrost and then suddenly erupts, it can turn into a fireball or just a very quick boom. So the thought is that some of these uh, holes may have been created by methane explosions, and some of them could be an example of the dynamics that both of my colleagues have mentioned called abrupt thaw. So inclusive of thermokarst lakes and the retrogressive thaw slumps, these abrupt thaw dynamics can thaw the really, really deep, dense, old permafrost that has up to 90% ice content. And what that basically means is instead of the three meters of gradual thaw and freezing that we're used to seeing every summer in the permafrost, you're seeing up to feet of degradation and loss in one event or over a couple of years. Why should we, why do we who live in the South need to care about this? What's the answer? <laughs> 
Well, of course, there are multiple reasons. Uh, the, the one I always put at the top of the list is one we've uh, all here already talked about, which is that what is happening in the Arctic is not staying in the Arctic. It is propagating uh, multiple forms of harm uh, over large distances into the bulk of the Northern Hemisphere, and in some cases around the whole world. For example, the accelerated melting of glaciers and the Greenland ice sheet uh, and the disintegration uh, even faster than simple melting is a major contribution to sea level rise. Sea level rise is happening globally and is impacting citizens uh, on coastlines all around the world. The addition of methane and carbon dioxide, as we've been discussing, to the atmosphere is accelerating climate change and accelerating all of climate change, uh, the, the wide range of impacts of climate change from wildfires to droughts to torrential downpours to more powerful storms to more and stronger heat waves. All of these things uh, are happening uh, under the rubric of global climate change, and that is being accelerated and may be accelerated much more by the release of carbon dioxide and methane from the permafrost. Uh, the further point that's very much worth making uh, is around solutions. Uh, the solution to the problem of rapid climate change in the Arctic and all of its impacts in the region and around the world has to be, above all, acceleration of the effort to reduce the emissions of heat trapping gases, principally carbon dioxide and methane, from the combustion of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, and from land use change all around the world. The whole world needs to participate in an accelerated effort to reduce the fundamental drivers of global climate change. Tony, uh, you know, we've covered the climate change story, as have, of course, many media, um, quite a bit. And I must confess, I think this may be the first time that we have covered this angle on it. But what's happening in the Arctic, as Kimberly just said, is going to affect the globe. And um, whereas uh, we have really only grasped, I think, what's the impact of the potential emissions of carbon just in the last decade. As I said earlier on, you know, the first publication really where everything was added up was just 2009. And since then, although we've added details and better models and all of these things, really the numbers more or less keep coming back the same way. That if we, uh, if we don't do very much, if we don't meet current uh, goals of one and a half degrees, then we're going to see some serious impacts of, of uh, carbon release from permafrost areas. And it's difficult to control. It cannot be controlled, as John just said earlier, within the permafrost areas themselves. It has to be controlled everywhere else. Um, and we know what to do. That's the, that's the good news. The good news is we know what to do. The thing is, it can't be done just in the Arctic. We have to reduce globally anthropogenic emissions.